Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming the multi-talented Jonathan Stark. Finally, I have a guest from the 1985 horror cult classic Fright Night, and I am so excited. It is going to be awesome. Jonathan, of course, started out as a member of the Groundlings. And um, then uh, he had acting roles in Fright Night, Project X, House 2, The Second Story. And then he transitioned into being a writer and producer for TV shows like Cheers, um, According to Jim, uh, Ellen, The Drew Carey Show, etc. And it's going to be great to have him on the show today. And it's been a while coming, and I can't wait. It's going to be awesome. Going to be interviewing Billy Cole from Fright Night. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Jonathan Stark. Well, welcome to the show, Jonathan. Uh, this oh, is, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yes, this is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Absolutely. What else What else have I got to do? Yeah. You now we're all kind of like in this thing. We're, we're sitting around the house. I mean, I'm doing stuff, you know, but I'm, I'm you know, I'm cleaning out the garage and I'm, I'm working in the backyard and I'm doing a, <clears throat> teaching a writing class and online. And But, but you know, it's not... It's not like what you call a full life. It's you know, just trying to find stuff to do. Yeah, everybody's like that uh, at this in the last like six months or so. Yeah. 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 So well, we're all getting stuff done that we've been putting off for a while, so that's good. Yeah. You gotta find the silver lining, right? Yeah, that's one positive that's coming from all of this. Absolutely. Yeah. So, going back in time, did you gravitate toward acting and performing early on in your childhood? Uh, you know, I, my, my dad was an actor in local, I'm from here in Pennsylvania, and my dad was an actor in the local community theater, which was called the Erie Playhouse. He did a lot of plays. In fact, I still have his um, original makeup box with all the stuff still in it. Mm -hmm. And he was... I unfortunately never got a chance to see him do it because he passed away when I was nine. Oh. <laughs> but uh, my mom used to tell me how good he was. And so I, I guess that might have been an influence for me. I, I, I'm not sure because I never, you know, grew up thinking I was going to be a, you know, make money as an actor or a writer or even, you know, leave Pennsylvania. But I, I did a lot of plays at my junior high school. Mm -hmm. and um, uh, not big parts, just kind of small parts. You know, I was always the, when we did The King and I, we'd do musicals, and they'd run for a couple weekends. Yeah. And it was for, it was in the summer. It was part of the some rec Erie recreational project thing. And, and I, when The King and I, I never got, like, a speaking part. I was kind of the guard that whenever The King was on stage, I'd have to stand on the, on the side of the stage with my arms crossed like I was some kind of, you know... Um, protector or, or, you know, bodyguard or something. Yeah. And I always had, you know, I had small parts, but I never got the big parts and things. I think probably because I, you know, I was, I don't have like a, this incredible singing voice. So, it, it, you know, if there was a bike, I, I had little parts. I'd walk on and have a line or something like that. But, um, I was never really thinking about acting as a career. So I went to college and I got a degree as an uh, art teacher. I, I was mm -hmm. uh, got my BA in art education, and I was <clears throat> certified to teach in Pennsylvania from grades kindergarten through twelfth. And after I got my degree, I just thought, I, you know, I don't think I want to do this. It's, you know, it's one of those things where it's like I don't know. I, I don't really want to be a. I don't want to be a teacher. I don't think I'm going to be a great teacher. And uh, you got to love it if you're going to be a good teacher, in my opinion. Yeah. So I just was kind of hanging out. This was in the, I don't know, 75, 76, in, kind of in bars and area and thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do. And a friend of mine <clears throat> said, uh, 
I went to a college in in area called Mercyhurst. It was a small liberal arts school. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, <clears throat> my roommate, by the way, for part of that time, and my best friend at, at this school was a guy named Michael Patrick King, who's also a writer and producer. He did Sex and the City and The Comeback and oh. all those uh, all those shows. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I was uh, trying to figure out what I was going to do, and a friend of mine said, "Hey, you know, I'm doing this show at the college." And somebody just dropped out, 1776. And uh, I, I, he said, do you want to do it or you want to come and audition? I said, well, sure, I'm not doing anything. So I did, and I got the part. And it was, uh, you know, the moment I walked out on the stage, you know, and the audience was there on the show, I, I, I just kind of said, I think this is what I want to do. It, it, it makes me happy. And um, I really kind of thought that that would be the best, you know, not knowing what I wanted to do, probably go and look for the thing that makes me happiest. Yeah, wow. So what year did you get to L.A.? I got to L.A., well, I went to, I, I was, <laughs> in 76, right after that, I, I got a job teaching at a summer camp in, right outside of Kingston, New York, and I was teaching uh, photography and I was kind of hanging out with this with the campers a lot, and you know they'd get high, and I I mean I wouldn't get high, but I'd kind of hang out with them and talk to them while they were getting high. And yeah. The camp director found out, and he got mad, you know, and <clears throat> and kind of took the kids away from me. So I was just kind of there on my own. Anyway, I, I met this girl, and she said, you know, I'm I'm driving out to California uh, after camp, and I said, yeah, that that sounds pretty good. I think I'll do that too. So we kind of, we, we drove out together and then lived together in San Francisco for about two years. And <laughs> then I came down to L.A. and I think 70, 77, I think it was, yeah, or 78 maybe. <clears throat> and uh, it's been down here ever since. Wow, yeah, I'm, I'm born and raised in San Francisco. Ah, yeah, nice town, but, but way too crowded for me. I, 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 I It's just too packed. And at the time, yeah. I had a, in 77, I guess, or 78, I had a four roommate, three roommates. We had a four bedroom uh, apartment in San Francisco for 400 bucks a month. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, <laughs> it, I mean, you, can't even, you couldn't even find a closet for 400 bucks a month in San Francisco now. Yeah, it's, it's insane there. You know, I had to leave there three years ago. It was just crazy over there. But, uh, yeah. So how did the, the the groundlings come into your life? Um, I, I, I was taking cla- uh, improv class with a guy named Bill Steinkelner, uh, who is really kind of my mentor and has kind of guided me through improv. He, he and his wife, Sherry, uh, were uh, ended up being uh, showrunners and executive producers on Cheers for many years after mm-hmm. uh, the Charles brothers left there. And uh, the, the director of the groundings would come in and substitute teach for Bill sometimes in his classes. And he just said to me one day, and a bunch of us that were in his class said, well, why don't you guys come, you can go right into the advanced class and take that and then take the, you know, get into the Sunday company and then hopefully you'll get voted into the main company. And, and that's how he did it. It was so easy back then. Now, if you're a groundling, you gotta start from the beginning and go through, you know, lots of classes beginning middle and yeah. uh, beginning middle and advanced and uh writing classes and sketch writing classes and all this stuff it's it's a lot longer process to to get into the groundings um but it's still i still go back there from time to time and, and do shows and i still know a lot of the people there and uh so i'm, I'm still you know it's my alma mater as far as comedy and so many of the people that i still am friends with today and still do improv with today. Some some of my I, I met there when I, I met them when I was there in the I guess it was kind of the early eighties. Mm-hmm. Who who was there when you got there? Um, well, there's uh, a lot of right. Well, there was uh, Phil Hartman was there, Paul Rubens, um, uh, Edie McClurg. Yeah, I'm trying to think of other people. Tress McNeil, who's like the biggest voiceover person in Los Angeles. Yep. Uh, uh, a guy named George McGrath, who's a writer. Robin Schiffer, writers. Judy Toll. 
um, <clears throat> there were just uh, 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 Kathy Griffin was there at the time, and so I knew. I mean, I, I you know I worked closely with a lot of those people. We did I did lo- um, scenes with Phil Hartman a lot, and I just love Phil. He was such a great guy. And I'm sorry, my dog's gone nuts here. It's okay. Um, but uh, but yeah, I I just. Those were people I was really close to, and I would I would spend a lot of the time, actually, um, you know, t- uh, talking with them and watching them on on stage because the way I really felt was important was to watch them, you know, watch what they were doing, mm-hmm. and and the more I watched them, the more I learned, and that's kind of the way I've always told people that I teach, either with just through improv or writing is to watch people that you think are better than you or read scripts by people that you think are better than you because that's how you learn, in my opinion, mostly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've talked to um, Lynn Stewart, Terry Bolo, Sandy Helberg, Phyllis Katz, Bridget Sienna, Wendy Goldman, uh, Mindy Sterling, Steve Hibbert, a lot of the Groundlings. Oh, yeah. I, have, I have such... Mindy and I, I, I know all those people. We were all through it pretty much. I mean, I think Mindy came a little later than me, but Mindy and I have known known each other since the gosh, I think the late '70s. And yeah. you know, all those people, Phyllis Katz, I still do a prop with Phyllis, and Steve Hibbert, I knew quite well. And you know, yeah, I know all those people, and they're great people, and they're wonderful improvisers. Uh huh. Yeah, very very talented people. And of, of course, uh, a couple years ago, um, Cynthia Zaghetti passed. Yeah, yeah, she was a big, uh, I'm with a group called the, the Transformers that, that uh, plays in, in L.A. I mean, obviously not now, but we, we've been together since, I guess, 1992 or 93. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've, we're still performing a, a guy named Jay Kogan, who's a writer, he's in it, and uh, yeah. my friend Harry Hannigan and a couple other people, and we've been doing it pretty much steady since 92. And, uh, I mean, you know, we've all kind of grown up within it. We've all gotten married within it. We've had kids within it and everything, but it still seems to be chugging along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like one big family that just won't split apart. Yeah, I mean, improv is a great tool, especially for writers, I think, and actors, really, because it teaches you to stay in the moment and not think ahead of yourself and and not think what you just did and not think what you're going to do, but you just stay right in the moment, listen to what somebody says, and and react off of that. So it's it's excellent for actors to take, and mm-hmm. and I also think it's terrific for writers because it, it teaches you not to, to, to let let go of your preconceived ideas and just keep writing. Mm-hmm. Did, did you have any standout characters on stage? Uh, boy, I don't, I, I, I don't, I've done a lot of characters on stage. I, I don't think I have, like, any that I could think of right offhand that would be, uh, that would be people that, something that either people would recognize or I would really go, yeah, that's probably a trademark of mine. Now, I just have done a lot of different characters. I, I like doing characters. I like doing, um, I like playing scenes that are funny, but not, like, jokey. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I just did a, a scene a scene night for for the Groundlings. This was, I guess, it was back in a year ago or something like that. It was for one of the, yeah, I think their forty fifth anniversary thing. And I did a scene with uh, George McGrath and Robin Schiff, and mm-hmm. um, and it was a uh, it was a lot of fun. It was great to go back. It was an old scene we had written a long time ago, and it was fun to redo it again. Did you, did you ever um, hope to get on Saturday Night Live? No, that was never... I was never, you know, into the sketch stuff. In fact, I was only in the Groundlings for about uh, maybe a little over a year. And it's a great place, but it's very political. And I just decided I didn't want to be involved in that. So I went back to the stage and started doing plays again. So I did some plays and... I think the first play I did back or the second play, um, Jackie Birch was in the audience, which I didn't even know. Nobody said that she was coming. And that was, those were the days when, when casting directors actually went to plays in L.A. They, I don't think they do that much anymore. But yeah. uh, but Jackie Birch was in the audience, and 
I got a call shortly after that saying, hey, uh, uh, I'm casting this movie called Fright Night. Do you, you know, you should come in and audition. And I, I said, well, sure, sure, I will. And um, she said he's, he, she, I think she sent me the side and explained he's kind of this familiar for the vampire and he's a really big guy. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm a pretty big guy, but I thought maybe I better, I put on, this was in the middle of summer, so I put on like five to ten shirts so I'd just be even bigger. <laughs> and I put uh, socks in my shoes and so I'd be taller. And uh, I'm, I'm already 6'4", but I thought I'd be maybe 6'6". Six, six. Mm -hmm. So it was the middle of summer and I've got eight shirts on and I'm sweating to death and I'm sitting, <laughs> sitting in the waiting room to audition. But... Um, uh, You've seen Fright Night, yeah? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So there's a there's a scene in Atlanta where I'm I'm sitting there with I'm standing there with uh, Art Evans and Bill Ragsdale when mm -hmm. he brings him in to tell him there's a coffin and the and that was the scene I had to read. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, well, you know, I'm thinking in the in the reading the scene and I'm thinking, well, let's see, what would I do if if this if if I was really Billy Cole, would I would I be mean and menacing? I thought no because that would be suspect. I mean, if I saw, if I was this detective and I saw this guy being mean and menacing, I would think, well, maybe something is going on. So I thought, all right, well, maybe I should be the opposite of that. Just, just, just be dismissive of the whole thing. So when I, when it came to the reading, I, I did, you know, I just kind of acted like, oh, this is really stupid. This is, this poor kid, he's such an idiot. And then did the, did the cross thing with my fingers and all that. And, and, you know, that wasn't in the script. And uh, they, they seemed to like it. So I went home and uh, I guess I got a call several days later that said, you know, Tom Holland saw your, uh, no, Tom was in the room. That's right, Tom. And he, it, they said, Tom really thought you did a great job of us. You and, you know, you know, so far you're the, you're, you're the, you're Billy. And I was like, oh my God, because I had not really done a film before. Mm. And he, so I, I kept thinking, well, oh, I'm sure I'll be getting a call. With them. You know, I definitely got it. You know, mm -hmm. they were seeing other people. And I was waiting, waiting, and a month went by, and I, I'd call, and, and it contacted Jack, you know, Jackie, did they, you know, she said, oh, you're still number one, still number one, still seeing people, though. Okay, another month would go by, I call again, and then another month went by. I was going out of my mind. Mm -hmm. Finally, I got the call. You know, they said, yep, yep, you're, you, they didn't find, uh, they didn't, you were the guy, you were the guy all along, so... I was uh, I was thrilled, and uh, I just spoke to it's 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 funny. I just <clears throat> we were contemplating doing a original cast reading of the script for right for like the night before Halloween. Yeah, and through Zoom, and <clears throat> you know, do like a, 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 a you you donate a certain amount of money that we do for maybe the actors fund here in LA or something like that. But I think we're going to wait and do it next year because we just don't have enough time to do it right now. But uh, we are definitely going to do, I found Dorothy Fielding, which nobody, nobody could find Dorothy. So I absolutely, I just found her a couple of days ago. So she's also oh. part of it. <laughs> so we're going to have the whole cast plus Art Evans plus Dorothy Fielding and probably going to do it next October sometime. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, wow. I, yeah, you're my first guest from the movie. It's, I've been on a long pilgrimage since 2017 to get somebody on here from the movie. Um, I tried Billy and um, Stephen Jeffries like three Halloweens in a row, and no response. And I just found out that Tom Holland has a website uh, with an email contact, so I'm going to try him for my Halloween shows this year and stuff. Oh, I, I'm sure Tom would do it. I'm sure Tom would do it. He's he's great about that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, he's he usually likes to um, talk about, and he's, so, he's got so much insight and so much knowledge about the the script and the and the shooting process that I certainly don't have. Yeah. And he'd be a terrific guest. Yeah, and I met him last year at Monster Palooza and Chris Sarandon, and I did not know what to expect with Chris Sarandon because I heard uh, he has he has uh, a reputation on movie sets for being kind of rough around the edges, but he was very humble. I told him, I said, uh, Mr. Sarandon, I think you're one of uh, the greatest American actors. And he said, thank you, Tommy, I appreciate that. And I didn't expect to hear that from him, but he was very nice. Well, I can't, you know, I certainly can't speak for any other movie set, but I can tell you that 
that Chris was the, the, the guy that I looked at, to, you know, basically shows the actors um, kind of operate all together, but they take their cues from the person that's the star. And right. Chris was nothing but humble and wonderful and so funny. And I was, we all had a great time. We all really cared a lot about each other. Wow. I didn't really work with Steve and Jeffries that much. I mean, my scenes with him were very minimal. But, um, <clears throat> but we, but so I didn't know Steven quite that well. But we've since become friends when we've done horror conventions and stuff. Mm. Um, so he, he, they're just all wonderful people. And Chris is, Chris is so funny. We would, whenever we'd have a scene together, and Bill Ragsdale was in it too, we'd all be sitting there just cracking each other up, just laughing. And this was, this was, we'd be waiting for, for Tom to say action. And we'd just be laughing hysterically. And Tom would go, okay, come on, you guys, come on. This is a scene where, you know, you're really scared, whatever it was. So we'd have to immediately just drop that. But, but most of the scenes you see with Chris and I together, right before that, we were, we were just laughing hysterically. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he becomes that character. It's like Jerry Dandridge is a, is a real person. It's just, it's so eerie and so, oh my God, it's a tour de force performance, I think. It is. I mean, he, he, I was just watching uh, Dog Day Afternoon just a couple days ago. Yeah. And Chris is, he, he, I, when I first met Chris, I had seen Dog Day Afternoon and I said, I said to him, I said, I have to tell you this. When I watched Dog Day Afternoon, I, I really thought you were that person. I didn't think you were acting. I thought they found some person just like that off on the street or who was an actor. And he just came in and did that because I, I couldn't believe how good it was and how committed it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything he's been in, he's been superb, I have to say. Uh, I was working with Roddy McDowell. Um, you know, Roddy and I didn't have that much stuff together. A few scenes, like when he comes in, uh, you know, at the door and all that stuff. But we didn't have that much stuff together. So I didn't, but I did, I did remember, you know, there's a lot of sitting around when you're waiting for, um, you know, your, your shot to come up or something. So you sit around a lot and Roddy would sit back there and tell uh, Hollywood stories. You know, they were just, you know, he, he just knew everything about Hollywood. He knew where all the bodies were buried. <laughs> and uh, I said to him, I said, Roddy, you know, you should, you really should write a book. And he said, oh, it would destroy this town. <laughs> so so the guy died with his secrets, I think. But uh, he was he was a wonderful man. And, he, you know, could have been that guy who kind of sloughed off and felt that he didn't have to work as hard as everybody else. But he actually worked harder than everybody else. I, he and Chris were, were, you know, just, I just looked at them and thought that that's the kind of actor I want to be like them. Yeah. I, I remember one story. Oh God. It's, 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 it makes me laugh so hard. Um, you know, Roddy McDowell and, and Billy Ragsdale, they were trying to, they were trying to get a third Fright Night made. Um, and, uh, it was through Jose, Jose, um, Menendez's, uh, company live entertainment. And, uh, yeah. you know, he wasn't very, he wasn't very nice to them. And after, um, his son shot him, um, uh, Billy called uh, Roddy up and said, "And said Jose Menendez uh, w was shot dead." And Roddy said, "I don't have an alibi. Do you?" <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Yeah, you know it's funny. Back back then, after Friday Night Two, even when Friday Night Two was made, it, it wasn't really a cult thing. It was just another vampire movie. Yeah. Uh, so people weren't inclined to want to make any sequels. I think, I, from what I understand, it, it was a little difficult to get even the second one made. Yeah. Not the remake, but the second one. And uh, but, but then after it became, after it started to take on a life of its own, it became really popular. And I, I'm sure that's why the remake was done, because, because the original had become so popular over time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I talked to um, a guy who was in the uh, the remake, and he's he, he he's pretty ash ashamed of it of how bad it turned out. But he was very happy to be in it, not just because he was a struggling actor, but because he loved the original. You know, right? Yeah, 
yeah, I, I, you know, there were some. I, I, I didn't. I, I can't say that it, it, it seemed to have the, the same uh, feel as the first one. It wasn't as much fun. It wasn't. But, but I thought, you know, I, 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 I thought it was. I thought there were some really good parts in it. I really liked the ending a lot. Um, uh, Colin uh, Farrell is he's just. He's brilliant. He's just a brilliant actor. And mm-hmm. uh, Chris told me he said. Uh, you know, because Chris had that part where he, he was the driver that Colin Farrell kills. And he said uh, when he came on set, he said Colin Farrell was 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 visibly nervous just to meet him. And, you know, he, he met him and, he, and, he, and I think Colin Farrell said something to the effect of like, I, I, I've been watching Bright Night since I was a kid. And he was just like, he was over, he was just so nervous to meet Chris. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, of course. I mean, he's a he's a very intense guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you ever think that the movie w- was a curse on your acting career? No, I I, I really because I played right after that. I I was in House Two. Right. I don't know if you saw that or not. But oh yeah, House Two was. <laughs> I, I did House a completely different. I did a completely different character. It was really probably closer to me than 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 Billy Cole was. Obviously, um, uh, more of a wise guy and, and just kind of fun and irresponsible. And so I played a bunch of different roles. I, I think it, it, I don't think it had anything to do with that. I think it was just like at the time, Fright Night wasn't such a wasn't that big a movie, and House Two was not a big movie at all. So it was just you know you, you got to keep your career going. And I probably uh, probably didn't do as much as I could have done to really keep it going. So. And, but you know, at, at some point, I just decided. I think in the, I mean, it was probably the late '80s, early '90s that I, if I was going to start going out for, if I was going to start doing parts, I really didn't want to go for one line. So I thought, well, maybe I should. Maybe I wonder about writing, and uh, yeah, and so I, that's how I kind of the impetus to do that. Yeah, uh, with House 2, yeah, I've had Ari on twice. He's a great guy. Very, He's ins- great. Very ins- yeah, I just I had lunch with him maybe right before the, probably last January. We, we, we hadn't seen each other in a long time. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, he's, he's a great guy. We had, a, we had a wonderful time together. Yeah, he's very insightful, very deep. Um, I've had Lara on three times. She's a special lady. I adore her. You had who? Oh, oh Lara, yeah, yeah. She's very nice. She's a sweetheart. Yeah, and uh, and Amy, I mean, they're all again. I I was lucky. I worked on a, a a terrific movie, and we all liked each other. And you know, there, there may have been stuff going on that I didn't know about, but but as far as I was concerned, I I, I had a wonderful time. I looked forward to going to work every day, and and uh, we had a lot of fun doing it. John Ratzenberger, who you worked with on Cheers, was in it. Um, yeah, yeah, he was in it. He he's and John's a John's a great guy. You know, I, 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 it was funny because, I, uh, you know, Ari was also in uh, Ellen, the, the Ellen show, right. uh, sitcom on TV, uh, when I was work, when I started working on it. He was one of Ellen's friends and I think left after that year or the year after. But, yeah. And then Bill Ragsdale actually played Ellen's boyfriend in, in a reoccurring role. I think he did two or three or four of them. I don't know. Uh, so it's it, it's interesting how you know the town is actually can be really small and you you meet a lot of people you know in, in going up going down and just just kind of you know within the different mediums of film and television you see you see the same actors sometimes. Mm-hmm. What was it like working uh, with Bill Maher? Bill was I, I thought Bill was um, really funny. I, I he, he was just naturally funny. He still I, I watched it a while back and you know he I, he makes me laugh. Yeah, I love his show and uh, so I, I I'm sure he would would remember me at all. But um, I do I, I did enjoy working with him. He always I mean he was quiet, but but he wasn't like we were best friends. But he was always nice. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, but I did. I still remember him saying, coming up with that thing. Somebody was something about when he walks. And he says, "Oh, you old golf bag." I I I don't remember the exact line, but it all, every time I hear it, it still makes me laugh. Yeah, 
How about, um, let's see, Kane Hodder was a stuntman on the movie. Yeah, I saw, I was at a, uh, a horror con about, I don't know, two, three years ago, and I saw Kane, and, you know, because he's, he's, he's making so much money in those horror cons because he's done so many of those things at, at the Friday the 13th. And I went up and, and I, I said hi to him, and, he, you know, he remembered me. He was, he, he actually got injured on House 2, there's a whole scene then, a scene with uh, battling these uh, these Mayans or whatever they are, and there's a lot of swinging on ropes and stuff. And I do remember he was swinging on a rope and fell off and got you know got injured. And but I guess that's the stunt man's life, you know. Mm -hmm. I guess that you have to expect to be injured if you're a stunt man at some point. Oh yeah, oh he he's got a lot of great stories. I've heard him tell on um, on, on other podcasts and, and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I've I've met him a couple of times at conventions. He's a very nice guy. He's a very nice guy. He's always late though. He 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 works out in, early in the morning, and he's always held up in the L.A. traffic. You know, getting to the oh, convention. Yeah. yeah, but but he's a he's a great guy. How about uh, working on Project X? That was, uh, that was, I, I was, uh, Matthew was wonderful, you know, a nice guy and Helen Hunt was, was nice. And I, I knew them kind of, I worked with Matthew mostly, but, uh, he was friends with Helen. He was going out with Jennifer Gray at the time. So, mm -hmm. uh, we would hang out. We would, I went out with Matthew and Jennifer a couple of times for dinner after, after we were working and they were great. And, and Helen was, was, I think. I think Matthew and Helen and I went to Magic Mountain one time, went to together. That's all I remember. I don't remember much more about that. But uh, again, I was I was really lucky. I've I've been I've been lucky to work on some shows where people are nice. Mm hmm. I think it's a sad movie. I, I I hate seeing anything that has to do with animal abuse. You know. Yeah, I I wasn't I I wasn't thrilled with it either. Because I had to actually watch the real videos of the of the chimps dying, and that was that was really hard. Of what you were saying, at least was fake. But I had to watch the real ones, yeah. and we went through two or three days of of dealing with the trainers because it was really uh, you really had to be very careful around the chimps because there were there were chimps and then there were chimps which the, the ones you had to be really careful of were the uh, the ones they got from circuses that they didn't want anymore the, these guys were obviously abused and not taken well care of so they they had a pretty bad attitude and the main thing was you just you never never made eye contact with them because eye contact with a chimp is is kind of tantamount to let's 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 go mm -hmm. you know so you always avoid eye contact, and, and any time during the movie, if you see a chimp with somebody being let down a hallway, it's always with the trainer. It was never just an extra. The trainer, and the tra and any time the chimps were with Matthew, or we did a scene with the chimps, the trainers were literally right around hiding behind pillars. That's mm -hmm. why there's pillars in that in the, in the scene of the big the big room, with so the trainers could hide behind them, so they could they could get there in in the event that that any of the chimps would go for you and it was possible that they would and in fact I was doing a scene where I'm walking down a hallway mm -hmm. and uh, when I just there's a trainer pulling a chimp just just to, just like an extra and man that chimp just jumped at me and I didn't even look at him and I mean that scared me because they, they the trainers like you said you know they they're they're so strong they could they can rip your arm off and beat you to death with it so yeah that kind of gives you a, a respect for nature that you would you might not normally have if you hadn't been you know tra trained in, in that kind of thing mm -hmm. <laughs> do you remember uh, guest starring on moonlighting barely you know i i had forgotten i had forgotten all that i did it and and then uh, somebody said, "I saw you on that show." I said, "Oh my God, yeah, I forgot." It was it was such a weird experience because I'm at, I'm at the very beginning. It was a night shoot, so you know you wait kind of all night for your shot, and then in the morning they 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 sh they shoot it they're like right before dawn, and and then they're done. They kind of leave you there, and you're left to go. But 
the strange thing was I was supposed to be a cop who is stopping a cocaine bust, and there's a point where I I take the I, I try the cocaine, you know, with my finger, and I, I sniff it, I guess, or, or something, and and I didn't know how to react because I I had never done cocaine, so I did this stupid reaction that <laughs> I go cut the director. I'm like, oh, what? He goes, yeah, you you really wouldn't react that way. Oh, oh, okay, all right, just tell me how to do it, you know? Yeah. So, but that was that was my one experience was playing a, a cocaine bust. Yeah. Oh, God, I've heard stories about how uh, by the third year of that show, things got really bad because Bruce Willis was doing movies simultaneously and Sybil Shepard uh, got pregnant and just only two, only two other people were, like, carrying the show. And that's why now they have, like, you know, 12 regulars now on a series just in case that ever happens again, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, can, be, it can be tough. Uh, on a series, I, I don't know that particular series. I don't know anybody that was on it, but yeah. you know, when when a, when a show becomes successful and the stars then are pretty much handed all the power, and, you know, power like that is a hard thing to deal with. With some people, some people can handle it really well, but others don't handle it well, and they become their own worst enemies. Yeah. Um, as far as those two, I, I really don't know, but uh, I've I've seen it on on more than one occasion. Mm -hmm. So you just have to, you know, the, the network says, well, you take care of it. We're paying you a lot of money. So you take care of it. So that's what you do, unless you want to quit. And most people, um, if they're given enough money, will will pretty much endure anything. Yeah, that's, unfor that's the unfortunate part. Money, it's always money. <laughs> But I don't, you know, it's it's not it's not so much infor unfortunate. It's like you you kind of go well. You, 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 if you're paid well to do a job that's hard, that's that's not unusual. People do really tough tough jobs, and if they're compensated for it, then you kind of go well. That's your choice. You you have the choice to keep doing it, or you can walk away. And they a lot of people cho choose to keep doing it because you want to make. You know, I was I was younger. Uh, younger uh, writer on the show and, and there were there were times when I was just like this is you know when I was working on Grey Gym there were times when I just said I, I this is really tough I don't know if I can do this mm -hmm. my wife's like well you know it's do, it's going it's it's going well and uh, you probably should think about if, if it goes into syndication then you know then that's a good thing so she was right I mean, I, st I stuck with it as, much, as long as I could, and it did go into syndication, so that was a good thing for all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how about the Tales from the Crypt, the Siamese Twins episode? Oh, yeah. Um, well, Tim Stack was a, good, was a groundling and uh, a friend, and we always, sometimes we did scenes, that we did one scene together, I think, that we were twins in, you know, in, the, in, the, comp in the groundling show. And uh, he, I got a call from him. He said, "Hey, I auditioned for this thing, and you really should, you really should do this with me. It's about Siamese twins." I said, "All right." So I came in and auditioned with him, and they hired us. Um, and they were great. The guys, um, uh, Pete Seaman, and uh, I forget the other guy's name. They were the guys that wrote, wrote Roger Rabbit. And um, there were, yeah. I mean, I had a great, I had a blast working on that. It was, uh, it was difficult though because we had to have this harness on that would connect us together. It never really worked right, and you know, sometimes it would, it would break, and you know, so there was a lot of technical stuff with it. Um, and then, of course, at, at some point, we had to show our asses when we're, you know, when they show the actual thing that goes between us so that was fun yeah but, right. you know it's fun it, I, I liked I, I really enjoy playing you know guys like that cra crazy killer guys like like Billy and like the, the guy on uh, Tales of Crypt those are fun because that's you know that's not really me but as as most actors will tell you there every character you play there's there's actually a part of you that is that person deep down inside and just kind of allowing it to be free and enjoying it you know so 
Yeah. Uh, Robert Zemeckis directed uh, Roger Rabbit. He produced Tales from the Crypt. Was, was it him you were thinking mm-hmm. about? What's that? Was it him you were thinking about? Uh, no, no, not really. I mean, I was just, uh, I was just, you know, when you say thinking about what you mean. Oh, because you, you said it, it, was, it, was, it was written by the guys who wrote Roger Rabbit. I was thinking maybe it was uh, Robert Zemeckis. Yeah, well, uh, no, uh, the guys that actually directed that um, episode of Tales of the Crypt was, was Pete, uh, Peter Seaman, and I can't think of the other, his, his right, Jeff, Jeff Price. Jeff, Jeff I Price, can't, I can't yeah. remember their, his last name, but those were the two guys who wrote that episode and directed it. Oh, okay. And then they also, then they went on to, uh, to write uh, Roger Rabbit. Okay, gotcha. And, uh, how about uh, Mom and Dad Saved the World? Well, that was a, yeah, that was um, through a friend of mine. Um, oh, God, why am I forgetting? He wrote uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Why is his name escaping you, right? Ed Solomon and Chris Matheson. Ed Solomon. Yeah, right. Ed, Ed, Ed. Yeah, I knew Ed. Um, I can't remember how I knew Ed, but I've known Ed for a long time. And, you know, he just, called me up and said, hey, can you come in and audition for this thing? Because they're, they're going to start shooting in a couple of days and they just want to get this cast. I said, sure, sure, I'll come in. So I came in and auditioned for it and I thought it was a lot of fun. You know, it was a quick thing, but it felt like a lot of fun. Yeah. So I auditioned for it and got it and, you know, went to Vasquez Rocks for one day and shot it. And, you know, it's it's it, it's a funny movie. I mean, it, there's some funny stuff in it. And I knew Lovitz, you know, I knew yeah. Lovitz from... Uh, from the Groundlings. He was in the Groundlings for, for a while when I was there, too. So... Yeah. He's he's yeah. he's beyond great in that role. I think it's a very underrated movie. Yeah. I mean, I, like I said, I haven't seen it in a while, but I I do remember certainly laughing at parts of it. Mm-hmm. So what, what made you transition into uh, writing and producing on TV? Well, my friend Bill Steinkiller, mentioned earlier uh he we were doing improv we had done improv together for a long time and he said yeah you know a script and i said well well no i i've never really thought about it he said well if you do improv you can write because basically doing improv is is writing on your feet so i said well yeah it kind of makes sense so uh i i called my uh somebody i knew from the groundlings tracy newman and I said, Tracy, I, I, do you want to you want to try and write something? And she said, Sure, why not? So we wrote for I don't know, like two years. We wrote two, like three or four spec scripts just to try and get an agent. And uh, we 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 did get an agent, not a very good one, but we did some little jobs that I you know that I probably I'm sure you couldn't even find on on YouTube anymore. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> then. We submitted one of our scripts. I, I called up Sherry, his wife, and I wanted to get a phone number for a friend. And she said, well, are you guys still writing? I said, yeah, yeah, we'll see this. She said, why don't you send me a script? I said, okay. So we sent her one of our scripts, and she called up in a couple, like two days later and said, you know, we really like your script. Do you want to work on Cheers? And we said, yeah, we do. I mean, of course. So it, our first job was was on Cheers, which was, we were, we were scared the hell out of us because it was so highly respected and everybody on it by, by season 10 was a, was a star, you, you know, and the Charles brothers and they weren't there that much, but Jimmy Burroughs was there and, you know, Jimmy and Ted would come into the room and we were just like, we were just terrified because <laughs> it was our first job. We didn't know what to say, but, uh, Bill and Sherry were great. They gave us three scripts our first year, so that was a, a real gift um, to have three scripts with our names on it on a show like that in the first year. I mean, most people would only get one script if they were lucky. Yeah. So then the following year, we went off and did uh, we went off with them and did Bob. Yeah. Which was the Bob Newhart thing, and that was. I, I, I still think that was the, my favorite thing I ever worked on because Bob Newhart was always, um, I, I, I'm a huge fan of Bob Newhart, always have been. I, I yeah. used to, my brother had his 
records, Button Down Mind, uh, Bob Newhart, and, and he'd listen to him, and I'd listen to him listening. I'd listen to him in the other room, and then he'd let me come in and listen to him, and, and I just thought he was brilliant. Yeah. And the great thing about Bob was before each show, and this was a live taping, so usually have a warm-up person come out, talk to the audience, get them laughing, you know, kind of get them in the mood for having fun for the show. But, it, but, but Bob would come out before and he'd talk to the audience for about 15, 20 minutes and he'd do something with stand-up. And I, I actually got to stand, you know, 20 feet away from him and watch him do his stand-up. To me, that was, uh, I was in heaven. I, I couldn't believe how lucky I was. Yeah. Plus, I really, I've always enjoyed working with Don Sherry. They just, they're so creative and so smart and, and you know, just great jokes. Great yeah. jokes and great stories. Yeah, it, it may not have been the best incarnation of, you know, a Bob Newhart sitcom, but at least you got to work with him. I mean, that's a huge honor right there. I, I did, and honestly, I, I, I have a, they, they do have, you can get the DVD of the, of the I don't know, 13 or 15 episodes that were done, and they're really good. I mean, they're not like the first two Bob Newharts, they're different, but they're really good. Yeah. And... Uh, I, I'm even in one of them. I get to play a big green elephant in one of them. So <laughs> that's that. That was fun for me. But no, the, the shows are really funny. Mm hmm. I mean, you got to do all these great uh, shows for like you know, you know, they were like vehicles for you know big name comedians. You know, Ellen, Drew Carey, according to Jim. I mean, wow. I mean, that's yeah. That's comedy royalty there. You know, you even yeah. I, I, Oh, go ahead. I understand Jim is doing a doing a. I'm about him growing about his uh, pot growing operation. Yeah, you you even wrote an episode of that short lived uh, sitcom Hardball that was on Fox for a brief yeah, time. Yeah. Yeah, with Joe that Rogan. Was, uh, well, that, 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 Jeff. Uh, no, I'm trying to think. Jeff. Uh, gosh, I can't think of the guy. I think it was Kevin. Current or somebody and Jeff, I can't remember his last name anymore. But uh, it, it was kind of a disaster from the beginning. It, it, you know, it was a Fox show, and they didn't like what was being done, and they were putting pressure on them, and they were getting upset about the whole thing. And they brought in a new showrunner to, to run it, mm -hmm. and they weren't happy about that. So it was just kind of one of those things where. Tracy and I spent a lot of time in our office while there was a lot of, you know, arguing and, 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 you know, bruised egos and everything, uh, happening outside of our office. But, uh, there were some really, there were terrific actors in it. There was, uh, Dan Floria, who was great and Bruce Greenberg yeah, and Joe, Ro Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan. It, and Mike Starr. Yeah. There were some really terrific actors in it. And, and I thought some of, the, some of the episodes were really good. Uh, Allie Wentworth was in it. So, uh, yeah, it was good. It was just one of those things, once in a while you, you get on a show that's just the, the network and the showrunners are fighting. And it's, it's, it's never pleasant to be around. But we were, you know, we were fairly low on the, on the ladder at that point. So we didn't have to really deal with that. Yeah, it was Jeff Martin. He was a uh, writer on Jeff The Simpsons. Martin. Yeah, he was a Simpsons writer. He's, he's, he's really funny. He's Jeff, a really funny guy. Uh, and Suzanne, I knew Suzanne, his wife, Martin, she worked on Ellen with me. Mm -hmm. And she, she's gone on to do a lot of different shows, I think Hot in Cleveland and then some other stuff, so... Yeah, Go, going back to, um, to Ari being on Ellen, he actually opened up to me um, in the last uh, 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 podcast that we did uh, earlier this summer, he was telling me, yeah, being on Ellen wasn't a good experience for him. It was like um, what we were talking about before, about how, you know, a star of a show can become their own worst enemy. And, of course, we we saw it this summer, you know, her, her talk show got canceled and all of that. Well, her talk show isn't. I mean, her talk show's coming back. They're doing a new season of it. It, it hasn't been canceled. I, I, here's what, I mean, a lot of people would ask me, you know, like, mm -hmm. what's the deal with Ellen? And I said, well, first of all, I haven't seen Ellen in 20 years, over 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know, you know, I, I can't speak for the last 22 years, but when we were on the show, she was never horrible to 
us, she, I mean, we certainly had, I, I certainly had my creative differences with her, but, but that's kind of the normal process. But I never, I never saw any of that. You know, I mean, there were, as far as I knew, there was never any, any kind of weird thing going on during the shows, like some, any kind of sexual harassment or anything like that, or, or people being out of line. Uh, I, I honestly, I, I, again, I, I'm not saying it did happen or it didn't happen, but, I don't, I say my guess is, and this is totally my own personal guess, is if this was going on, I don't think she do. Uh, mm. But again, she's, you, you, the buck has to stop somewhere, so obviously it's with her. So, I, I, but as far as I know, I just saw on, on television, I think yesterday, that, that the, the, a new season is, is coming soon. So, I, I don't think it's been canceled. Okay, I, I didn't hear that. that. That's news to me. So... When COVID isn't going on, I mean, do you still write and produce? Well, I don't produce because producing would, would actually mean that you have to, that the show is in production. But I'm writing. I, I have a bunch of scripts. I have a couple out there. And there's, you know, we'll see what happens. I, mean, I don't know. I'm, it's a good time to write because what else am I, like I said at the beginning, what else am I going to do? So it's, yeah, I've been, I've been writing some stuff and I'm, I'm kind of in a place now where I'm writing more of what I really want to write mm -hmm. and what, what makes me happy to write. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm really liking that. I'm really enjoying writing more of what I want to write. As a pro, I spent, you know, 20 years writing a lot of sitcoms, what, what the network wants, what the stars want, what everybody else wants. And that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. I got yeah. made a good living from it. But now it's now I feel like it's time for me to write some stuff about like like one of them one of them is about the, I think the main couple in it is 50 in their 50s and he's got to take care of his father who's 84 mm -hmm. his, his father's uh, um, ex or new wife is something like 78 so everybody in it is, is pretty old but I just thought you know I'm, I'm an older writer so why, why do I I'm not going to write 20 year olds I'll let, I'll let 20 year olds write that yeah. or, or 30 year olds or 40 year olds I, I want to write more of my own age so that's what I've been doing have you ever uh, tried to uh, get a movie made as a writer I've written a couple of movies with a friend of mine uh, named uh, Tab Murphy who's uh, a uh, writer he, I don't know uh, you know if you know the movie um, oh my god I am having such a, a brain fart right now about some of his <laughs> names and stuff. Uh, Last of the Dogmen. It's a terrific movie yes. if you haven't seen it with Barbara Hershey. And, yes. Um, anyway, he wrote that and directed that many years ago and then he kind of got, um, he kind of he started writing animation so he wrote the movie Tarzan, wrote Atlantis, he wrote um, The Rock Hunchback of Notre Dame and he kind of got stuck in animation but he he's been kind of writing his way out of that. He just sold a movie. Uh, they're doing a remake of The Changeling from mm -hmm. 1980, the George C. Scott movie. And he just re he just did the rewrite of that, and they're going to remake that movie in Ireland, I think. It's a great movie. So, yeah. Yeah, so Tab and I, yeah, it is a great movie. And, and Tab and I wrote two movies together that, you know, are kind of, they're kind of circulating. I don't know if anything will ever happen with them, but they're kind of circulating. But it was fun to write it. It's just, Movies are really, really hard to, hard to get made nowadays because they're, you know, you're not talking about the expense of a pilot on, on TV, which can be, you know, 750000 to a million to sometimes up to a million and a half for a pilot. That's relatively cheap. But when you're talking about a movie getting made, you're, you're, you're talking about, you know, you know, anywhere from three to five to eight million dollars just, just, just to get a simple and that, that's not even like a big superhero movie or anything with a lot of facts. That's just a simple um, character story. And people are reluctant to spend that money. So they, they, it, it, it's very it's very difficult to um, push anything through. So I, I and honestly, I, I like movies. I watch movies all the time. I'm a big horror fan. But I, I do like writing TV the best. Oh, that's good. Do you, do you do the uh, horror cons at all? What's that? Do you do the horror cons at all? 
Uh, I do. Uh, I, I, I like to do them whenever it's uh, about whenever the whole cast for Friday Night is there because that's really fun. Yeah. You know, just we have so many laughs. We laugh the whole weekend and we all enjoy being around each other. And usually on Saturday nights, we, we make a reservation and go have dinner. Um, so uh, that's kind of like what we've been doing every time. But um, I can't really, I can't really go on them now. Obviously, and sometimes it, that market gets saturated. Yeah, and I think it's been saturated. So I can't really. Uh, uh, we haven't been doing the thing where we're all together again, but hopefully. Uh, we'll do one uh, this year whenever things open up. Yeah, last year, I mean, I was happy when Tom Holland and Chris Sarandon was there. Uh, I was hoping that you and Ragsdale and Amanda Bierce would uh, would be there as well, and Steven, you know. But, yeah, that would be great if they got all you guys that one uh, next year, especially in California, because I'd be there in a heartbeat. Yeah, they, uh, I think, people that actually live here in California now are are Tom and his mom is in Seattle and, and Bill and uh, uh, Chris are back. I think they're in Connecticut somewhere. They live, I think Bill lives within a half an hour where Chris lives. I think I think Stephen lives oh. in San Francisco. Who? Oh, it's Stephen. Yeah, Stephen lives in San Francisco. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, I would love to do another one, especially now that we found Dorothy Fielding. Mm-hmm. You know, she's never been to any of them, and I think I ta- I was just talking to Dorothy yesterday. She called and and I said, "Neil, you, know, you should do one." She said, I, I, "I'd love to do one," and and, and I said, "Well, you got to bring pictures because you really are the only cast member who has never signed anything for Fright Night, and people would be bringing all their posters because that would kind of complete their I think their cast because you've got Art Evans who got Art. Art went with us one time. Yeah. He, he, we had a blast with Art. But he, he doesn't go to a lot of them. But to have everybody there with Art and Dorothy, I think that would be that would be a first. We've never had that before. So we'll see. Maybe we'll maybe we'll do that. I don't know where. But we should also I, I I'd love to do some in um in England or Europe somewhere because I get people all the time from you know, from Facebook and stuff like that, who would say, oh, are you, you know, why don't you come over to England? I said, I'd, I'd love to, but nobody has, uh, you know, really asked all of us yet. I think it's probably pretty expensive to get eight of us over there. Yeah. You know, so so I guess it's tough, but I, I would think there'd be a huge market to, for people in Europe and, and uh, you know, Great Britain and all those places to, that, that would want to get their stuff signed. Absolutely, yes. I have a uh, Fright Night poster that um, that Tom and Chris signed. Chris signed over the the face of the ghost on there, and I was like, oh, God, I wish he didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I, hopefully we'll do that. So if anybody out there is, uh, is listening and wants to book the whole group, I think it would be a, a, a smart, a smart uh, investment. But, again, I don't run these things, so I don't know anything about them. You know, how, you know the success of them, but also, I mean, I, I don't know why we can't go to Canada and do so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jonathan, I thank you so much for coming on today. This was really great, and uh, stay safe out there because we need you. And next year, hopefully, uh, with the conventions, um, we'll start up again and stuff. I'll get to meet you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if I'm at one and you're there, please come on and hang out with us. You know, uh, it's always it's always a, a good time to hang out with the crowd because we sit there at our tables and we take our pictures and we sign our stuff and and we also make each other laugh the whole time. So mm-hmm. it's a lot of fun. You can you you can be part of that. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, you have yourself a great day. You too. Okay. Bye bye. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Jonathan Stark. Ain't he a cool dude? Oh, what a nice guy, huh? And he's got great stories. And it was a, an honor to talk to him. Um, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. 
Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Till next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, There's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes! Every night I rock myself to sleep thinking about you.